Welcome to Sidgwick High School. Obviously, everybody that's familiar with Sidgwick all knows that this is not Sidgwick High School, but it was at one time Sidgwick High School. It was built in 1893 uh, as the first high school in the town of Sidgwick. Before that time, uh, all the schools were one room schoolhouses. The town recognized around 1890 that they had an increasing population and they needed a true high school building. And so the funds were voted and this building was built just around 1892, 1893 and opened up as the four room classroom space for Sidgwick High School at that point in time. And it was Sidgwick High School until 1917. And at that point, the town population had increased further and Sidgwick High School here uh, was shut down and a new high school building, what we call Gates School, Gates Intermediate School, was built uh, as the new high school. We're in the uh, Little Red Schoolhouse, which is uh, the original Sidgwick High School. And the part of the building that we're in now is the volunteer area. And I'd like to introduce everybody to Betty Meisner, who is the chairman of the board of trustees. And Betty will maybe make some comments on how we operate this building and why it's an important part of the Sidgwick Historical Society. Ah, uh, thank you, Betty. Yeah. I want everybody to know that we are open six days a week, Monday through Saturday, 10 o'clock in the morning until 4 p.m. And we are staffed by volunteers. And if you're looking for a job, we'd love to have you. Okay, uh, we're in the genealogy room of the uh, schoolhouse, and this is the room where people come from uh, out of state oftentimes and study their family history. We have a vast amount of information in here. But before I get into that, I'd like to point out these three photographs right here. It's a, you know, there's an old saying that a picture is worth a thousand words, and it really applies here. Here is the Little Red Schoolhouse right here. It was not located where it is today. It was located up on First Parish Road, kind of where the C section of Gates Intermediate School is located today. And to the right of the, uh, the schoolhouse, high school, such high school, was the original town hall. So once again, the high school was built in 1893, and the Situate Town Hall that was right next door was built in 1849, I believe. Uh, the town outgrew this particular building, and so by 1917, the funds had been voted by the annual town meeting to build a new high school. And this is the new high school. The problem is, the new high school was at the same location where the original high school, this building, was located, and so they had to move it. And they moved it to the present location, and you can see it's not very clear, uh, probably, but you can see the building where we are at right now is right here. Then in 1930, they outgrew the high school again, and so they added on these wings to the building. Here's the main part of the building right here. And this was a flat roof building in 1917. When they added on these additions, they put on the pitched roof that we have today. I'd like to point out this window right here. It's a circular window and it is this window right here. Uh, around 15 years ago, they were doing a lot of renovation work at the school, and this window here had fallen apart to the point where the glass had come out of it. Uh, it was almost to the point where the carpenters over at Gate School were thinking about throwing it away, but they fortunately brought it over here, asked us if we wanted it, and we said, sure, why not? We'll, we'll store it away until we can think of what we are going to do with it. And then when we did the restoration work here, um, we used this particular window and put it right there. All right, um, we have this portrait of George Washington hanging here. And the reason we have it hanging here is that every school in the United States uh, at one point in time had a portrait of George Washington in the classrooms. Now, Betty, do you remember your, your school when uh, you were going and do they have a portrait of George Washington? Absolutely. And the school was still there and I bet George is still there Probably too. Probably still there too, yeah. right? <laughs> this is an interesting piece here. It's a diploma that was given to Lewis Edward Cole. He graduated from Citra High School from this building. 
1898. And the plumbers in those days were very large, as you can see. Today they're much smaller. Maybe they're trying to save paper today, I don't know. But uh, it's an interesting item to have in here. The bookcase, to those of you who want to come and do some research, Situa Vital Records are over on the side. On this area here, we have vital records from a lot of the surrounding towns, and not only Plymouth County, but other counties. Over here, uh, we, begin in, we begin the family history. And they're in alphabetical order, starting over here, of all the early families in Situa. We have great sources, that life, such as the Great Migration. Um, over here on this side are um, Jeremy Bang's compilation of Situa Town Records, which was a wonderful resource. Um, we have uh, in the uh, volunteer area a gift shop where a lot of the books that we have available are sold. Um, we have uh, a vast uh, array of different topics um, plus I items that, that are available for purchase. Um, we also have right here um, the road sign that was at the border between Situate and Cohasset back in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. It's made out of bronze. It was designed by a local um, sign maker. His name was Jesse Litchfield. And in the center here, it has the town seal of Situate. The date of the town was incorporated 1636, and it's made out of solid bronze. And what was happening to these signs in the 1950s, they were being stolen, a scrap. And so this is the only one that was left of the, those original signs that were at the border of um, Norwell and Situate, and Situate and Marshfield, and Cohasset and Situate. So we put it away, and it stored it over the Cudworth barn. But it, uh, it was something we really wanted to have here. So when we did the restoration work on this building two or three years ago, uh, we made sure that this got back in here. In a prominent spot. In a prominent spot. Because <laughs> it's fascinating. Everybody comments on that when they come in. All right, we are in the, um, what we call the map room, but it's not just a map room. It's a room that contains a lot of the photographs that we have. Um, in the society, and we have literally thousands of photographs. Many of them are available to the public for uh, research and that kind of thing. Uh, one of the photographs that we had, uh, like down at the Maritime Museum, this was just a little little guy that was about like this, but we had it blown up um, to become a photo mural on the wall here, and it shows the grist mill down in Greenbush. And the grist mill is this building right here. Next door to the grist mill, which is this one right here, was a sawmill. That is no longer there. The grist mill was actually the power source for the sawmill. Um, so we've been able to restore the, the grist mill. Uh, this is what today would be called Country Way. And over here would be Greenbush Pond. And we just found out a couple of weeks ago uh, that Greenbush Pond uh, is the oldest dammed pond in the United States, kind of a federal survey. They date the dam to 1640. So we are always finding out new interesting things, and that's certainly something that we'd like to, like, we'll brag about from now on, let's put it that way. Um, this is probably the oldest item that we have in the society. It's a grain chest that was used at the grist mill and it's probably dating back to 1650 or so. I'm going to open it up. It's pretty yeah, fragile, but it'll open up like this. And it's got three compartments for storing ground flour. And it's got these grooves on the top for pouring the, the flour into the various sections. Uh, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston borrowed this from us a few years ago because it was such a primitive old piece and they were very anxious to put it on exhibit and so they had it for two or three years and then they returned it to us. In 1903, Plymouth County commissioned uh, maps to be made of every town in the 
in the county. Um, so obviously Situate is in this particular atlas. Um, looking at Plate 31, which is a good part of the town of Situate. Um, and the interesting thing about this particular um, atlas is that it shows the location of every house that was in every town in the county. But in addition to that, they listed the owner of the house as it was in 1903. I would think, and Betty probably you would agree, that second to genealogy research going on here, it's people coming in looking to find out how old their house is. Absolutely. And uh, this is an incredible resource for them. We have also all kinds of other maps, but this is a very useful map. And this atlas, by the way, was in extremely bad condition uh, until we had it restored with community preservation funds. And that allowed us to uh, restore this atlas to a condition that people can use. It was so fragile before we couldn't have it out now and now it's available for everybody to use. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to point out again for this building is that we restored this building using community preservation funds back around nine, or 2008 or so and the building today is much more user friendly than it was before. We are in the what we call the main conference room. Um, I also like to refer it as to the Maritime Library part of the building. I'm, I'm particularly interested in maritime history and uh, so all of that is in this room as well. Uh, if you have seen the, the uh, program on the Maritime Museum, um, I mentioned down there a, a, one of the divers that has had worked with us on a lot of the shipwrecks off the Citra coastline, Bill Carter. And Bill had uh, put together volume after volume after volume of shipwrecks that he had dived on, just opening up to a random page. And um, the records that he donated to us show the location of the wreck, the name of the wreck, the year that it sank, uh, the conditions, the depth, and all that, and so it's in these volumes. Uh, and he also cross-referenced it to index cards that are located right here. So every wreck that has occurred in New England, off the coast of New England, is documented in these volumes. There's probably 10 or 15 volumes here. Over here, there are publications, booklets, documents uh, that relate to maritime history. Pretty much everything that you would see over in this section are only available here. There's no other museum that, that would hold these. Over here, we have these interesting pieces. People are always asking us what these are. They look like pretty bad condition copper. And what these are actually are the, um, the, the top spires of every point that was that's at Lawson Tower. And when we reshingle the Lawson Tower back around 2003 or so, um, these came off because they were in such poor condition. They've been on there since 1902 and we had new ones manufactured. We certainly didn't want to throw the old ones out so we stored them over here. And two more things. Uh, obviously, we ready to go Zach? Yeah. Okay. Uh, two more things. We have a very unique um, exhibit of many of the lighthouses that you can visit across the United States. These are cast iron door stops and they're pretty heavy. Each one of those lighthouses individually weighs about 10 pounds. So I think I figured out that on this wall we have five to six hundred pounds of lighthouses. Uh, we had to have the, the shelves built especially so that they could handle that kind of weight. The lighthouses start in the upper corner over here and progress across like this, and then like this, and then like this, 
uh, across the country. So Maine would be up from the top all the way to the Great Lakes over here. And the model we have of situate light is really a special piece. When we were restoring this building, a fellow came in from the Cape who was a model maker of lighthouses and he does very fine work and he had made models of lighthouses for the National Park Service uh, among others and he offered to make a model of situate light free of charge which is the way we like it and um, he took the measurements we told him where the model would be going so he knew exactly how wide the base had to be and he spent the next year making this particular model and we're really thrilled to have it because it's such a high quality model. For some reason, situate light is difficult to paint. It's difficult to make a model of because many people don't get the, uh, the dimensions quite right. And something always looks a little strange about it. But this lighthouse model you see here <coughs> is, is perfect. Uh, all of the dimensions to it are exact. And it even has the doors open uh, here and here. I'm not going to do it, but they do. There you go. Uh, he spent a tremendous amount of time on it. And then around the time that we were finishing up the building, he delivered it to us on the cake. He used the original blueprints, didn't he? He did use yes. the original blueprints, yeah. One last thing oh, yes. that I'm going to point out is the sign situate. And that came off one of the railroad stations in town. I think it may have been the railroad station that was right next door to the fire station on First Parish Road. So as you pulled into the railroad station, you would see the end of the building situate. And it had been put away for many, many years we had no opportunity to use it until we had restored the building. 